let it run for a second. We are recording the interview of Paul Johnson. This interview is being conducted by Adrian Hill and Jeremy Dobbins from the Wright State University Veteran Voices Project. The interview is being recorded at Wright State University Veteran and Military Center in Dayton, Ohio. It is 11 a.m. on May 14, 2014. All right, Paul, when and where were you born? I was born in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1970, October of 1970. Okay. Um, who were your parents and what were their occupations? Uh, my pr parents are um, Ronald and Gail Johnston. Uh, my dad was a um, salesman and a uh, previous veteran U.S. Navy and my mom was and is a, a nurse and um, so that was their occupations. Okay. Um, your dad was in the Navy you said? He was. Did he serve overseas at all? Uh, he did. Uh, he had a tour in the Med and, um, and then he separated from the, the Navy. Okay. Um, what about siblings? Do you have any siblings? I have uh, two brothers, uh, Mark and Tim. And um, Mark uh, uh, didn't follow into the military. He's a, an engineer uh, working on aircraft and whatnot. Uh, but uh, Tim did follow in uh, to the Navy and is now uh, working for an aerospace company as well. Okay. Um, so. How many of them were in the military then? You said so uh, uh, Tim and I uh, are were. Uh, Tim was in the military, and I uh, retired out of the military. He had a tour in uh, the U.S. Navy, uh, and then separated early from the U.S. Navy. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so, how did you um, decide you were going to join the military? What led you to that decision? Um, my decision to, to join the military really was sparked by. Uh, an interest in uh, the, the services and, and their their prestige as well as the uh, how they were represented and, and how people represented themselves to me even at an early age you know when, when I would do a Halloween dress up I want to dress up as a soldier and uh, being able to uh, go to air shows and, and be able to see the flight line and got a chance to do that at Loring Air Force Base in Maine and Pease Air Force Base in New Hampshire and uh, just really was in awe of the, the aircraft and the, the capability that it brought. So uh, that's really you know where a lot of my interest. Um, obviously there was a lot of help financially that could come with an Air Force ROTC scholarship and that's uh, what prompted me to pursue getting into Air Force ROTC when I completed my high school. So you did Air Force then? I did. And is there a reason you chose Air Force over the other branches? Um, no, I can't say there was anything particular about uh, the the Air Force other than, you know, aircraft. I was always draw, drawing aircraft growing up and, and getting to see um, the aircraft up close at those different base tours uh, really affected me as well. So I think that was probably my first preference. Um, did you grow up around here? I'm sorry. You I grew up, up in New England. You grew up in New England. So you were talking about, the, is there an Air Force base close to there then? Uh, not anymore. No, you know, at be. that time, there was a, a base in New Hampshire and a base in, uh, in Maine close to where we were living. And so um, I visited uh, the flight line and that was quite a, you know, a distinctive visit. It wasn't something that I always did. It was uh, something we looked forward to and did on, on a unique basis. And so it was a good time and, and be able to see uh, the aircraft and stuff, and I think that's what prompted me to pursue the Air Force ROTC versus another service. Okay. And what do you, do you recall the name of the base? Uh, Loring Air Force Base Loring. in Maine, and then Pease okay. Air Force Base in New Hampshire. Okay. Um, so can you kind of walk me through the process? You said you got out of high school, and then you went to. Yeah, I trans uh, transferred just uh, with the family, jobs and health out to Arizona, and so I finished up my high school in Tucson, Arizona and um, applied to Air Force ROTC at the University of Arizona. Um, came from a, really a small town upbringing and, and you know, certainly schools and whatnot. Uh, I liked having the small community and uh, Tucson was huge you know, to me. So getting uh, finished off in school and heading off to a big university like the University of Arizona, um, I didn't stay long at the University of Arizona. It wasn't the environment that I wanted. It was just a huge campus. 
but uh, Air Force ROTC stuck with me. And um, so I went up to Northern Arizona University and uh, entered their Air Force ROTC program there and uh, finished off my degree in business administration. Human resource management was the emphasis and um, commissioned as an officer uh, out of that detachment. Uh, at that time, they had asked me on a what's called a dream sheet, what would I like to do in the Air Force? And, and there was some research involved as to what the Air Force's needs were, and, and uh, you did a little write-up on what, uh, how you think you could contribute to the Air Force mission. And um, what was interesting to me was that out of my top three choices, um, I was, the Air Force gave me an opportunity to, over time, to occupy two of my top three choices, not just one, getting a, a job because of um, I, I had a chance to be a personnel officer for the Air Force, exercising my human resources management interest in taking care of people, which I did as a resident assistant on the campus, and it's something that was uh, obviously an interest for me in having the degree, um, but also being a chance to be a commander. You know, section commander at that time was a specialty that was a shred out. It was a specific job for you to do that you would be coded to do um, regularly. Uh, Air Force changed that and kind of sucked it into the great big personnel community uh, in the United States Air Force, but I had a chance to do both during the progress of my career. And um, it was very enjoyable taking care of people and taking care of organizations as the commander. Uh, was very rewarding. Okay, so um, how did you end up in Arizona? I'm sorry, I don't think... Uh, it was really for my family's uh, job economy changes as well as health. Uh, the dry climate in Arizona was really what drew, drew us there and um, so I was a junior in, in high school coming into my junior year mm -hmm. and so um, that was really the first big move that I can remember uh, taking, uh, it's not that moves even for our family were unusual. I remember that, you know, by looking through slides and pictures at the time, we'd already made a move from Worcester to Holden and from Holden up to what was a small town uh, called uh, Lyman, Maine, still delivering milk and ice cream and butter at the door. Um, and then moving from Lyman, Maine to Goffstown, another small town in New Hampshire, before heading on to Arizona for that uh, transplant out to the west. Okay. Uh, you know, at the time, you know, our grandparents didn't know what to think about that with, you know, Arizona being out west and they thought it was bonanza time and, you know, all the, all the you know, Indians and it was rough out there and, and so they didn't know what to think. Um, and it wasn't once they got a chance to come out and see us and you know they got a chance to really enjoy in fact they ultimately transplanted out uh, a little later for health reasons as well and we were able to kind of take care of them a little bit but uh, being able to adjust to you know circ life circumstances was something that uh, we were kind of nomadic even before getting into the military but uh, it certainly uh, took on a, a more characteristic uh, flavor as we got into the military and uh, that's both for uh, for me and my family as well as my family to be as I got married. Okay, great. Um, so you went from ROTC, you graduated, you get commissioned. Where do you where do you go first? Uh, well, our, my first assignment was to Hill Air Force Base, and at that time you had to wait to to enter into the service. And so, um, as I was waiting to come on active duty, I took on a temp job working, making boxes for you know refrigerators and washers and, and getting into the workforce and kind of getting some interesting experience in, in the industrial areas. And then we headed off. My wife and I had gotten married during that intervening time and, and um, so we took our first move up to Hill Air Force Base, our first uh, long trip in the car, you know, 14 some odd hours and uh, arrived up at Hill Air Force Base up in Ogden, Utah. And uh, when I got there, I, I showed up into the uh, mission support squadron with a military personnel flight and said, I'm here. Uh, and they say, who are you? <laughs> you know, and so it, my first experience was um, seeing a little bit of where the bureaucracy is and where even though I'm a personnel guy, it doesn't mean I'm working with all the other personnel guys, mm -hmm. uh, which would come up to, uh, reoccurringly throughout my career, working section commander type stuff as well as other duties. 
And so uh, they got me over to where the fighter wing was, the 388th fighter wing, and I was working in their quality improvement uh, office, doing a lot of uh, training and, and uh, teaching uh, during that time. That was a big time for doing improvement in the Air Force and fundamentally teaching and training the material. And so that's what I did in my first couple of years in the service. Okay. Um, how long were you in again? Did you, did you, did you uh, I was in for 20 years. 20 years. Okay. So um, what uh, after that then? Uh, after that, I uh, transferred over from the 38th Fighter Wing uh, to the uh, Mission Support Squadron, the one I had stopped in earlier on, to continue my development as a personnel officer and got the opportunity to lead a section and then to lead a, 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 a branch of the flight. Uh, before moving on to Robbins Air Force Base. And uh, during that time, I got a chance to finish up my military personnel flight uh, experience running the other complementary branches, two branches in the flight, and uh, getting a lot of experience with preparing for deployment and, and preparing the personnel team that deploys. And uh, running deployment lines was something I learned at Hill Air Force Base. At, uh, disaster control groups that you know things bad things happen and you need to have a responsive team that can advise senior leadership on uh, what the considerations are and so I got involved in the disaster control group at uh, Hill Air Force Base and continued to serve on that uh, at Robbins Air Force Base along with running deployment lines and, and preparing for deployment and then continuing to educate myself you know, that master's degree was uh, at that time a, a big emphasis and it still is uh, to continue your learning and education, so I started a, a master's program there. And my supervision, my unit was very supportive in that, and not only with Air Force tuition assistance, but also in, uh, in accommodating uh, time over the lunch hour for me to take a class, and uh, so that was very convenient. It was actually in, in a building uh, right by where I worked, and so I did that and worked, and you know, we're still growing our family. So it was a crazy time, actually. I had uh, one, one child arrive right before the move, and then uh, I had twins arrive while I was stationed at Robbins. And so uh, life was crazy. Uh, but got a chance to, at both uh, assignments, uh, live on base and base housing, and got a chance to um, just build friendships with other uh, military folks and, and certainly have uh, a lot of safety and security involved with uh, being able to quickly transition into a home and get to work and, and be able to um, provide for my family while I'm doing that. What, did, what was your opinion on uh, base housing for, from your experiences in it? Well, um, this was the old uh, Cape Heart type housing at each of, the, each of the bases. I mean, they look fairly similar even though you went from one base to another. Um, so you found ways to, to work with some of the space constraints because they were built like in the 50s. And, and so you, you get creative, and uh, you weren't too concerned about the, the style and polish of your furniture. It was a lot more you know, functional and getting a chance to see what you needed and, and being able to um, just keep yourself organized and do a lot of yard sales because you couldn't store stuff. Um, so it was, uh, I thought, a, a really good experience for a young family to have, particularly getting started um, because it was... It was exactly what we what we needed as a young family getting started, and uh, it gave us a, a chance to, to quickly get up to speed, you know, with these different military moves. It's not something that uh, was variable on the market. It's not something at that time where you had uh, the uh, the housing crash that uh, in several years in the future would become a real big issue for military people uh, transitioning uh, what they do, and um, and so being able to know that military housing was a, a benefit and something that helped me get to know uh, counterparts, partners in the effort at that military installation pretty quickly because they were my neighbors. Okay, so what's, uh, what's next after, was it Robinson? Uh, it was Robbins Air Force Base um, and so that was, um, we're talking about 2000 now, so I'd been in for about six years and finishing up at Robbins Air Force Base uh, I got an opportunity uh, to get selected to go back into a, a university environment and teach and train other uh, cadets to become officers in the Air Force ROTC program. At which university? It was at Emory-Riddle Aeronautical University in Prescott, Arizona. Okay. And so 
that wasn't my alma mater, but it was down the road, and it, it got us a chance to um, be close to a family again for at least a little bit, and, and also it had uh, the third largest cadet corps uh, in the nation, and so it was a very large operation for training officers and preparing them for service in the Air Force. Um, it was impressive to see how much energy, enthusiasm, and how active the cadet wing was at that time. These are these are students learning their degrees. Well, many of them engineers. You know, time management was already a, a premium for them, uh, but still, how busy they were in uh, cadet wing activities and growing their leadership. And uh, during that time, 9/11 uh, happened. Now, I remember clearly that uh, we were at there early in the morning for a PT session and I'd stepped into the, uh, the cadet corps, uh, the, the detachment offices and uh, heard on, on the radio uh, that the Twin Towers had been hit and then um, you know everything kind of changed really from there. Um, Emory Riddle Aeronautical University at that time, uh, you may recall that one of the, uh, the pilots of one of those aircraft was attributed to an Emeritus training program. And so there was, there was quite a lot of attention on the university at that time, not to mention uh, the military response as well as uh, you know, civil protection during that time as to how far this was going to go. And so I remember that um, we were concerned for the protection and the security of the cadets because they were very visible. And uh, one of the things that uh, was organized is to have them come out of their uniforms uh, for that particular formative time and uh, continue to, to attend their classes, and one not including classes that I taught, but that we would be a little low, low profile. Um, it was at that time that I really started to recognize the differences in the different services, because even now at, at these things, there's different service response to 9-11. Uh, we were not the only ROTC detachment at the university. The Army ROTC, right down the way from us, had a very different response. They went into Class A's. And so it was really uh, interesting to see the different responses uh, and the rationales for the different responses, because there was a rationale for each uh, different choice that was made. And then uh, Emory Riddle Aeronautical University set up security at their gate as well, to where there was a single entry and exit. Uh, because they were concerned about uh, threats to the university and the overall campus environment based on that, um, that news feature about uh, uh, the pilot and possible links to Emory Riddle. So um, it, I think, helped me and helped the cadets to see that you know, quietness doesn't remain very long on the horizon, especially when we're working to provide defense in a very um, different environment today than uh, the early 80s. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was um, three years there for Air Force ROTC and, and um, lots of great leadership opportunities for them and for me. And, and I went on to come back to Scott Air Force Base uh, working in the tanker airlift control center. Uh, this was my first tour working for Air Mobility Command. My previous um, jobs at both Hill Air Force Base and Robbins Air Force Base were associated with Air Force Materiel Command. Um, and then of course ROTC is, is training and, and associated with the Training Command. But uh, this was my first tour in uh, working with Air Mobility Command professionals uh, doing airlift, doing uh, medevac, and uh, focusing on that area. And the Tanker Air Control Center was the operations center for all of that activity. Uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week working global missions uh, to wherever the, the needs were. Uh, it will be refueling, whether it be cargo, whether it be medevac, and so it was a very interesting assignment, uh, lots of exposure to uh, another area of the Air Force that I hadn't seen, and I got a chance to uh, again be a uh, section commander there. I had done both personnel and section commander work at Robbins Air Force Base before going into ROTC, and so this was my uh, opportunity to work a uh, section commander position at a higher level, working for a general officer and working uh, a larger group of people. 
and so it was a wing level organization and, and I got a chance to do that for a year before going on to the Air Mobility Command staff. And uh, they, as a, for human resources and working uh, for people programs across the military, um, the major command staff uh, does a lot of work to uh, augment what the bases do to care for people. And you know, anything that's a, you know, deeper program planning, uh, you know, any kind of realignments or standing up units or, um, you know, the deeper, uh, more technical aspects of taking care of people and organizations is, was handled at the major command. And so I had a chance to, to be on some action staffs for that and working uh, even in the director's action group and standing that up at uh, what would become a Air Mobility Command A1. Before that, it was just director of personnel. In fact, the uh, organizational changes happened to where we're going to align uh, a lot more, <clears throat> a lot more like the other services. Uh, you know, in the Army, it's the the G1, and in the Air Force now it's the A1. And so there was a, a lot more joint organizational constructs being built, even at that time. And uh, so I was a part of that with the Air Mobility Command staff building some of that structure and, and uh, reducing the amount of staff that uh, a major command needed to have. And so it was an overall Air Force level uh, project that we were sort of the, the forerunners, the, the planners for uh, Air, Air Mobility Command. And then we worked closely with Air Combat Command on that. And so uh, from there, I went on to my first flight command, working in the military personnel flight at Scott Air Force Base, um, which is a a huge um, milestone for a personnel officer to do to have uh, upwards of 50 to 60 personnel that you're responsible for across uh, the multitude of human resources uh, activity that happens at a base and uh, to be at a headquarters base like Air Mobility Command's Scott Air Force Base with lots of um, different demands uh, on personnel uh, was great just to be a part of that and uh, the 375th Airlift Wing uh, was my home after that. You know, being able to go through three units even in the short time I was there shows how you know dynamic and flexible being an Air Force officer can be sometimes. Because uh, while I was there, I had one, three, four, I had five jobs uh, in the four job uh, four years that I was there, and uh, four years was very unusual. Uh, usually, it was three years. And so that's another one of the changes that happened during that time is extending the, the PCS tours to four years. So um, finished up there working for the wing commander as his executive officer and, and then went on to uh, some professional development. So each time I went in and, and got a chance to get involved in Air Force mission, there, there was a cycle that brought me back into training. You know, Air Force ROTC was me doing the training, uh, but after Scott, I went to Montgomery yeah, Maxwell Air Force Base to look, go through intermediate developmental education at the Air Command Staff College. Spent nine months uh, there uh, working back in a college environment, being a student and, and learning about how to command as well as uh, expand leadership and organizational skills that I would need for the future. And I did that with my peers, other majors in the Air Force as well as uh, from the other services. We had Army and Navy and uh, we had foreign officers as well, and so it was a, not only a joint environment, it was a, a uh, conglomerate of uh, international military professionals. And so um, that was just another new experience to see how we fight together. We actually train together in preparation for those uh, coalition efforts uh, that happen in war. Uh, so after that, I got assigned to what would be Vance Air Force Base, or to me, that was uh, an unusual phone call. You know, I had put uh, uh, my hat in the ring for uh, competition for squadron command, and um, I got a call saying that uh, one of the my three choices, sort of like that dream sheet again, right, uh, had had been filled from within, so they needed another option, and they kind of showed me where the different uh, different command options were. And I just put down, you know, Vance Air Force Base. I didn't really think too much about it at the time. Uh, and uh, 
but uh, that's ultimately where I got selected to command the 71st Force Support Squadron. And I remember getting the notification, telling my wife, and then going, Enid, Oklahoma, and getting on Google Earth, which was just, just another technical thing, but it happened to go zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. It's just this, the, the Air Force Base, Vance Air Force Base, was actually smaller than the Ford operating base that I was deployed to working with the Army uh, two years later. And, and so it was right down in the, in the small little uh, countryside of Enid, Oklahoma, and it was a flying training base. And so uh, I got a chance to see not only how do we train our pilots, it's sort of an extension of what Emory Riddle was doing from a university standpoint in their flight program, because uh, that would be with so many people training in the flight program, we saw a lot of those those folks uh, later on down the road in pilot training. Uh, but also even working on contract management, which was another part of how we go to war and stuff, leveraging contracts and, and contract performance. Well, uh, half of my mission as the Force Support Squadron Commander was run by a contractor for the, the services and the club and, and uh, some of the support areas there. Got a chance to see you know, how that performance worked, how it was managed, Got to see um, the company's response to a union strike. Uh, got to reconstitute um, lodging operations in two days there under government control uh, because the contractor was not able to perform. Um, got a chance to see um, surging manpower pools when a lot of these you know, contracted areas needed help. We went into contingency mode for personnel support. And so I got a chance to see a lot of that happen as well. And so, uh, again, some unique experiences that, that you're like, you know, where, how does this stuff all fold together? And it, it's just amazing the, the different experiences you can gain in the Air Force. And, and I remember uh, deploying folks, the UAV mission was taking off and how it was affecting even how pilots were trained and what their perspective on their future profession was, unmanned aerial vehicles. So I'm going to be flipping levers on a box, not really flying. And it's like the Air Force's response to that had to be clear and had to uh, respect the, the new cadet coming in. And so it was an interesting time to be able to see the Air Force come into its own with regards to unmanned aerial flight and being able to socialize and, and, and affect the culture of the Air Force at the same time. But you know, were they going to be considered rated officers, or were they not? You know, these are personnel considerations, but they were really service considerations that I got a chance to see and support while I was at Vance Air Force Base. And so, um, and, and even from an acquisition standpoint, which I wouldn't know at the time, but it's something that came up later, you know, I got to see a little bit of how we are modernizing some of the aircraft, like the T-38, which was a supersonic trainer there, and the, the Texan was there being used for as a primary trainer. Um, you know, later I'd you know find details through talking with my peers about how those systems were being uh, operated, but also maintained and then sustained through their their program. So, um, Advanced Air Force Base, uh, this would have been in 2010. Uh, I got a chance to lead a a strategy office for the wing, doing more again quality improvement again. So what I entered into the service, started doing some training in quality improvement. Well, um, at the, the tail end of my career, I began doing that again, and being able to do uh, efforts to make sure that we were used our resources as uh, efficiently as we could, being able to prioritize, because you never really have the resources that you need. You got to prioritize uh, where they're going to give you the biggest impact for the mission. And then being able to work with leadership and establish how we're going to track and monitor some of this activity so that, that we can continue to get better in, in how we execute the mission. Um, ironically enough, uh, before I was a year in that job, I was deployed for 365 uh, deployment. Uh, this is year-long deployments were uh, somewhat new to the Air Force. Uh, not new to the Army, and, and, but new to the Air Force, where our standard footing at that time was a four-month deployment. Um, so I went out and uh, was assigned to do 
uh, transition team work on a logistics military advisor team. It was a what was termed at that time a combat advisor team. And so additional training with the Army was required. I went down to uh, Louisiana to Fort Polk and got uh, trained at uh, a renowned facility there, Tigerland, you know, kind of has heritage back to, to Vietnam where training was done there as well uh, for a very unique skill set of being an advisor. And it was helpful, not only my personnel background, but also being able to be in so many different training uh, units over the progress of my career, different kinds of training, different kinds of needs, and uh, being able to, to organize that kind of activity. Because once I deployed over to Iraq for Operation Iraqi Freedom, uh, that was really the, the ins and out day-to-day -day activity, is, is collaborating with the Army Brigade that we were attached to. Uh, and we would uh, synchronize our activity for helping the, the Iraqis to to expand the, the durability of their training, help them to gain training, uh, help them to organize and equip uh, their forces so that they could basically regrow their military. Um, it was very fragile. And so we did that in subject matter expert small teams. And so I had a team of uh, 10 professionals that were subject matter experts in their respective fields focused on uh, the Army's uh, sustainment basis for the Iraqi military. There was two regional bases that we were responsible for. Each one of these regional bases basically carried the support for an Iraqi division in that province. And so uh, we would go out and travel on ground convoy, which is part of what we were trained for at uh, Fort Polk. Kind of a new thing for an Air Force guy to be running a convoy. But that's what we did. Uh, we were the uh, the preponderance of that of that team it's actually the 10 people that i had responsibility for it was really the air force component of a larger effort that i led uh, that had uh, army trainers as well as a, a large segment of uh, translators and so there was at one time uh, upwards i think 25 uh, people on the team as we organized convoys and established missions to go to uh, these different bases uh, Kirkuk was our primary area, and it was 20 miles to the west of the Iranian border. And so it was not lost on the, the Army and Air Force professionals involved uh, how close we were to you know, a, a historical enemy of the Iraqi people, but also, from a sectarian standpoint, um, a very influential neighbor. And um, that was all the context, partly uh, as we went about doing our training. Uh, it was uh, seeing how the military leadership was changing, uh, some of it influenced by uh, your sectarian affiliation, um, how they, you know, from a cultural standpoint, how they uh, provided accountability for their military forces, how they led. You know, they had a supervisory committee. And so having that NCO leadership, for example, at the fundamental level, that was very difficult. That was a new concept that um, was slow in coming to the Iraqi army. Uh, even supervision in and of itself, because of their thought process for a supervisory committee, really rolled it all the way up to the, the base commander involved and what their impressions and you know, uh, you know, what they would respond to verbally or non-verbally with the folks that were under their command. And so it was a very different dynamic that I got a chance to, to be a part of as his advisor amongst the rest of my team because we went in, it was uh, usually uh, two military personnel and a translator focusing with the, the base commander but each one of the other members of the team would have a translator working different functional aspects of that mission as well. And so we'd go out on missions. It was an hour and a half commute each way uh, every time we went out and we went out every day. And so it was um, tiring, physically demanding. Um, it was uh, something where y you did feel like you were part of a team, but it required a lot of discipline, discipline in thinking, discipline in planning, um, to orchestrate these different pieces together. 
Uh, we had the Army Brigade, we had the, the training team headquarters folks for ITAM at Union 3, FOB Union 3, which is in the green zone of Baghdad. We, had, uh, we were at FOB War Horse, uh, where the brigade was king. They owned the, the battle space and they were responsible for that FOB, but they didn't own us. That created consternation at some times when we were on the same mission, but they didn't own us. Headquarters ITM back at Union 3 owned us and, and directed our missions. So um, the idea that uh, you know collaborating with partners in the effort wasn't always clean. And uh, you know, I did a lot of effort with the brigade to, to synchronize our efforts with theirs and also uh, towards the end of the tour, they really leveraged us to uh, provide a very big effort that became really the centerpiece of what um, the Joint Forces uh, team in Iraq was doing at the time, which was a, a big showcase event at the division level using, using the 5th Iraqi Division, which was out of Kirkuk. They did a lot of you know, complimenting fires, they did a big push on ammo and fuel and maintenance, and we were in the the middle of that, um, and leveraging the relationship with the base commander, who was the provisioning base for the 5th Iraqi Army Division. And uh, we established a uh, expeditionary compound uh, with the brigade. Out, We actually lived out at the Iraqi base for several uh, months. We'd go on rotations, but we were actually posted out there uh, in, uh, in cycles. So we actually got a chance to be not only uh, a tenant on an Iraqi base, but also work very closely with uh, the Army company responsible for that um, outpost. Um, during the latter part of the deployment, we did not continue to do our own convoys. We were getting smaller, we were transitioning into sustainment operations, we are moving on from Iraqi freedom to Operation New Dawn, non-combat operations. And so the, the need for convo convoys was being much more centralized. The Army Group Brigade was really providing us transportation services, uh, which was you know, certainly to a degree more convenient, uh, but we found that it constrained the amount of time that we could go on mission, because we'd have to orchestrate for when they were going out on a logistics convoy or some other need to be out going out to Kirkuk, which is uh, you know, just one of their concerns of the time. And so it was very complimentary when that outpost was stood up at Kirkuk uh, to uh, bed down with them and spend a significant amount of time as being the liaison with the base, helping make sure they, they got support, but also being able to share those relationships that we had built with uh, the training brigade commander on the Iraqi side who was on the base as well, uh, the base commander who was responsible for housing and real estate and how it was being used on that post, as well as uh, some of the range concerns. Um, just even being able to take care of water and power was the base commander's issue, and it wasn't a given. Um, so those are some of the things we were working with them on and actually enabled the Air Force and the Army team that I was part of to continue mission and to be able to contribute to the brigade's overall line of effort uh, which was expanding their ability to self-sustain their own operations, their own planning. So as you can tell just by the, how much I'm talking about it, it was a rewarding deployment. Uh, it was a, a year of time away from the family, but I, I really enjoyed the deployment and uh, the impact that I felt like I made uh, on mission. Um, when you, can you, um, I want to start wrapping it up here in a minute, but okay. I want to ask you a couple questions about the deployment. Okay. Um, one, what, what kind of uh, recreation did you guys have? Um, while you were there? Well, while we were there, we were assigned to, to FOB War Horse, and so it was a um, really a converted community airport. Um, and what I mean by that is the, the main road on the FOB was the runway. Everything else was dirt roads, and, and so you really didn't have a lot of option other than going to the gym. They had weights, and had free weights as well as some Nautilus stuff. You had a basketball court in which we participated in, did some. Uh, uh, just basketball, little tournaments, little three-on-three pickup basketball. Uh, for running around the installation, you know, we basically were running on uh, the dirt roads around the, the perimeter of the FOB, the in interior perimeter of the FOB, and uh, just trying to be careful because you know the weather in Iraq is uh, just as crazy as it is here. 
So you'd be dealing with uh, you know mud and dust storms and you know, all kinds of stuff that uh, can get you injured as well as affect uh, your life as you prepare for convoys and, and take care of your team. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so coming home, um, what was that like for you? Uh, well, coming home, you know, one of the things that my family and I, we decided was for our, our mid-tour break was not to come home to Enid Air Force Base, Vance, Vance Air Force Base at Enid, Oklahoma, where, because it was going to be uh, really too tough because I'm just going right back again. And so we, we took a, a vacation together with the family and, and, uh, and that was really a, a, a great time to rebuild connections with, uh, I have three daughters and, and my wife and uh, it was really a rewarding time to rebuild some connections with the family before going back into the fight and then at the end of my tour, um, coming back, it was really precarious for me because it was at the end of my assignment there um, I already had a, an assignment uh, orders to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base here in Dayton and, uh, and so that there really wasn't a team for me to plug into. It was, I was very, you know, transitory. You know, I had some R&R &R leave to, to use and whatnot, and that's great, but aside from getting set to pack out and, and uh, wrap up my issues in the office, um, I really felt that the difference of not having a team to click right back into. And so um, we moved out of uh, Vance Air Force Base to Wright-Patterson in Dayton and um, into the Aeronautical Systems Center. And lo and behold, with all these transformations that are happening over the Air Force in my career, uh, I would be in the throes of another one, uh, where uh, Air Force Materiel Command uh, was reducing from 12 centers providing sustainment and acquisition support to the Air Force down to five centers. And the Aeronautical Systems Center was going to be part of that, uh, to where it was going to actually subsume uh, two other centers, reestablish itself as a whole new entity, and uh, be able to provide cradle-to-grave acquisition management for uh, the Air Force systems. Okay. And so uh, that's what I did uh, as I finished my military tour of duty, and that's also uh, what I transitioned to do um, as a civilian. So, has that transition, what year did you get out of the, what year did you retire? I retired in September of 2014. Okay, so very recently. Um, I know, you, so now you work on the base still as a civilian, correct? Was the transition... As a contractor. As a contractor, correct. Yeah, um, so was there any, was the transition weird for you at all, in any way, uh, or hard? I'm, I did this, the transition, I think, it was something that uh, even though you go through the TAP classes and whatnot, uh, you really can't prepare yourself until you're in it. Because there's, you know, there's mental pathways, there's things that habits that you need to create that you haven't needed to e even exercise before because they were embedded into what you did. Uh, you had a global address list. You could dial up, you know, figure out who someone was and get their telephone number and what organization they were part of in a heartbeat. That doesn't exist when you're on the on the job market trying to affiliate yourself with a new job. You know, being able to communicate what you do and how you do it, even though I was in a you know very transitionable skill, a human resource manager, how the civilian side does personnel management was very different than the military and has also gone through its changes, just like the military um, HR management has changed, and so. Um, I found it to be you know, a very difficult transition, but one where there was lots of support still to be had. There was support groups that were established that I got a chance to, to practice interviewing with, got a chance to hone my networking skills as well as to, to really think through how do I want to go about networking? How, do, how should I use my time? How do I keep myself accountable? Um, what are the ways that we support each other in this job search? Because it was other job seekers like myself. You know, how do we use the technology and not let that technology um, take advantage of us? Some folks would go and, and hit Glassdoor or Indeed and, and just be searching for jobs all day. Pretty soon you, you really get demoralized doing that because it's, it's in, all it is is a window into an environment that doesn't get you that much closer to a job. It's simply a, a, an informational board. It's not 
all that, you know, like a military process would be everything is hard coded, it's everything is a step by step, and then it comes to a conclusion. It's not really like that. You have information that's available to you, but you don't get to see what's behind the door. How do those processes work? You know, how much influence does my resume have on a hiring authority? Do I get any feedback? Which is generally no, you don't get any feedback. Um, now you can incorporate feedback in early on before you're applying for jobs and, and you train your mind into how do you anticipate the needs of the company that has a position available? How do you anticipate their needs? And so that's where I went, I, trying to learn the new pathway of thinking just like I would in the military where you prepare and, su and support a senior officer, for example, I need to look at that company as that, that senior individual. And what are the, how do I anticipate their needs? What, what are they telling me? And how does that inform what I put on my resume? How does that inform uh, what do I leave out of my resume so that I get to focus them on the areas that are most appropriate, the areas that they care about? How do I build networks? And, and get a chance to, to rub shoulders with folks so that I know how they communicate, I know what their concerns are, because even culturally, they're different than the military that I came from. Mm -hmm. So that was really, a, a for me, a uh, extended process. I was on, on the market, if you will, internally from the end of May through um, January of 2015. Okay. And so... Okay. Um, we only got a minute, a couple minutes left here. So, can you give me just a couple of reflections? Maybe um, you know how you felt about your military experience overall. Um, the military and I, um, I think it was for me an, an, a, a learning process all the way through. It was certainly an opportunity to demonstrate leadership, and that was very important to me. Uh, but it was learning through that leadership over the progress of 20 years that really made it rewarding. Um, getting a chance to be part of teams, being a apprenticed to, to affiliate with so many different kinds of uh, military professionals, uh, mostly Air Force, but some other, and uh, being trusted to be competent and to have an area of responsibility. Uh, that is something that uh, you don't really know what you have until you don't have it any longer. And I think there's a lot of military professionals that, uh, veterans that, uh, that separate from the Air Force, veterans that uh, retire, that probably see that same thing happening where they were given great responsibilities and uh, that it's, it's a very different environment because the stakes are different. When you're dealing with life and equipment and a national mission, a military mission, the stakes are pretty high and a lot is expected. And so transitioning for me from that to the civil sector, um, it really helped me to just appreciate the opportunity I had serving the military all the more and uh, to be able to know that that period of my life is over. Great. Well, um, Paul, I think that's it. Unless you've got anything else you want to add? No, I appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks for uh, doing the interview and thank you for your service.